All right, let's go. So this is my uh, vaguely named talk, Where Are We Going With Observability? It's a ploy to make sure that I can disappoint you regardless of what you came in for. So I'm Adrian, I work at Elastic, um, and I uh, work in open source, and um, recently, um, more often in open telemetry. And uh, this includes Gen AI. We'll talk about the Gen part. Um, and I wanted to, to warn you all, I'm uh, only a few months in. On the bright side, um, I still remember pains, which may be useful for some of you who have just gotten started or, or haven't yet yourself. And um, this is the agenda. And on, on the path to disappointment, I'm going to give everyone a chance to be disappointed uh, throughout, um, regardless of where you're coming from. Um, you might find something boring or too, too deep, um, many chances here. Uh, we'll start with a sync on observability. I'm sure people have seen many, many observability talks, but there might be someone who hasn't. Um, and then uh, the Gen AI part. And then we'll do it both ways. Um, OK, what about observing uh, generative AI systems? And how do I make my observability systems better with Gen AI? And when I say make things better, it doesn't necessarily mean you personally make things. Uh, plenty of uh, vendors will sell you those things, <laughs> including mine. Um, but uh, this is basically some things I thought were interesting to share. Um, so this is CNCF event. I think it's the second largest project by contributors, maybe. Uh, Open Telemetry is a, is a typical entry point into things like um, the monitoring world, uh, which people will hate me for saying. And uh, particularly, this works on uh, specifications, like what type of data is recorded, um, and some shared tools for doing the recording, like SDKs, and tools for using it, like um, you know, uh, collectors and such. And so the first slides will just go over some, some basic stuff. And I've, I've been, uh, I'm going to reuse this slide, which is uh, maybe seven or eight years old, but hey, still got it. Um, this, when I was first trying to figure out um, observability in, in a general sense. Um, so a friend of mine, uh, Peter Bergen, had this, this approach by saying, like, hey, let's look at the focal areas of each of these type of signals. And what do they focus on? And that's a kind of a, as good a way as any uh, to, to talk about these things that come up often. For example, um, the focus of logging is, is like an event. In fact, um, Open Telemetry has log events. Literally, you can, you can look up what that means. Um, but basically, our first program was a log statement, hello world. We're familiar with logs. Everything produces them. Um, and, um, but fundamentally, it's, it's, it's one, th one discrete thing that's happened. And if there are a sequence of things that happen and they're, they're related, it's usually by correlation. Maybe they have some property or, or timeline in, in general. Um, on the other hand, metrics is, uh, focuses on aggregation, so multiple things at the same time. So um, for example, if you were to do like a roll up of logs based on some field you've parsed, such as a service name, that would be an aggregation of, of events. And maybe if it had some data in there like uh, size of things written, then that could be uh, a statistic that, that would show up in your metric system, uh, um, the population of values that that those events represent. And um, you know, tracing is an interesting one um, because this is more about causality, like what caused what to happen. Uh, one of the tricky things about um, logs usually is that um, we're looking at correlation, not causality. Something may have happened after another thing, but it may just be coincidental, um, whereas tracing has like a, a hierarchical relationship usually. Uh, where you can have like this this request did cause that request, not just happens to be at the same time as that request. Um, and there's an interesting um, overlap if we look at both ways. Like of course, um, tracing has a lot to uh, to do with events. Um, you can look at tracing usually has metrics uh, has a relationship to metrics through duration. So um, you can uh, you can find some some overlaps, and that's why kind of observability usually has these three signals they talk about. Of course, now we have, we're have we talking about more things. Like if you're a Go programmer, recent versions of Go have, have a logging API for structured events. And I'm not sure if it's a snark, but I hope it was. They call it slog. <laughs> you know, hey, it wasn't me. 
Um, but uh, so, so, and then of course there's uh, this thing you may have heard about uh, continuous profiling, which, which is it's a neat way to do uh, basically samples where you can get a visibility of things down to like kernel level um, without, um, without any preparation, which is quite neat. Um, no time to talk to those things, but if you're interested in that, definitely look in more into observability. If we're trying to convert one thing to another, the most often thing we convert from is log because that's what we have most, most of. If you've seen this before, this is a, a grok uh, pattern um, and it would find ways to parse things out um, that then you can use those fields in other systems either to correlate or to, to use as a fact. And you know, when you have uh, things pulled out of your log that you, that you find in common, like for example, the pod name, um, you know, anything that, that, um, that can be used to stitch these together is helpful when you're navigating your metrics or your dashboards or whatever. Um, and you, do, you only have a, a little constraint there, which is that a metric usually you can't like unroll into like the million requests that made up that metric. So you can't, you know, get, um, take a metric and turn it into a bunch of request IDs. Um, whereas the things that are more like event-based, you can, you can go the other way with. And that's why it looks a little bit asymmetric there. So um, the main point of these type of signal talk is that we, you know, it's part of our job as technologists is to, you know, leverage strengths of tools and not, not be, um, uh, you know, using one thing for everything. Um, logs are perfect for things like monoliths where everything is always in the same box black boxes for the same reason when I say black box, I mean like some system you can't really affect, like a, a cloud platform, like say if you're using um, Microsoft Azure's OpenAI, you can't tell them to put your code inside of it. The only thing you can do is like pull its event hub feed and like get some information that it's willing to tell you. Um, those are logs, right? Um, and then of course our favorite exceptions, when errors happen, they usually are in logs, right? So stack traces, things like that. We love metrics because, um, you know, as systems folks and platform folks, we have many things going on, and we want to be able to understand patterns of the population of services, and uh, we need something to use for an alerting system, and, and it would be quite tedious to like look at every single request and decide uh, individually, uh, so that's why we use metrics. And then, of course, if we're, if we're drilling down into particular um, uh, causal investigations, traces are pretty help helpful. And so traditionally, observability focuses on, on uh, collecting these things and primary signals. And if you're using traditional tools, then you're choosing your dashboards and maybe choosing fields to put into them. And those things based on what you care most about in your, in your particular uh, context. If you hear this word called instrumentation, it usually means you're doing a lot of work. <laughs> it's like uh, adding agents to collect things. And, and uh, you know, maybe that's, that's um, not a huge amount of work, but usually there's some work involved. Um, and uh, regardless, we're going to get logs. Um, but, but the traditional problem uh, people face is, is getting something useful out of them. Now I'm going to switch to Gen AI. So Gen AI uh, is a part of AI, and I'll kind of tease that out a little bit more later. But if you wanted to know where to look for a place that does a good job talking about this from a point of expertise is a, instead of like a three-monther, uh, you go to the CNCF tag runtime. Now that's the same runtime for Kubernetes itself. So it's an interesting thing, the coupling there. So CNCF decided to put the AI working group inside the runtime tag. And there's some interesting side effects to that. Um, and uh, so um, I think a lot of people could do worse than, than look at those docs. Anyway, I'll go through any, my version of it. So gen means generative because we found like term Terminator AI is not a good path. So we want to generate, not terminate. <laughs> um, so that's the first point. Um, and what it's generating is new data based on data that's, that it knows about, right? So um, another interesting thing is that if you take a generative model um, and you were to try kind of like go down uh, like classification narrowing, causal language model is a form of generative model that goes in one direction and predicts words. So you can think of like auto-completion as the most uh, fundamental type of a prediction, um, but there's plenty of different things. Uh, the word LLM, uh, which is thrown around a lot, is large language model. So that's a kind of causal model, which is a kind of generative model. And that's used to perform functions like chat and co-completion and other things. Um, 
And so if you were like, you know, interesting in esoteric geography and you wanted to know about this Bouvet Island um, and you could ask the, the LLM uh, and it could, it, could, it could answer you as a role of assistant and say, uh, you know, if, if it's correct, it was a South Atlantic Ocean, and that would be something it could answer if there was some data about geography and, um, that it had seen before. Um, we sometimes use the word training imprecisely. It doesn't mean it was trained on geography. It just means that it has seen data with geography in it. And um, while that's kind of just nuanced, it's, it's kind of useful to know that. So this is introducing two primary things of, of LLM tools in general, which is that their roles, user and assistant, are always there. So when you say like AI assistant, it could mean anything from chat or something that uses an LLM. Assistant is a, is a word that's, that's common in that uh, jargon. Um, what we like about LLMs often is that they know what we mean. Like I can't... Um, write a SQL query and have it just like understand, oh, I just misspelled this column. <laughs> like uh, even worse, if I tried to uh, use the wrong syntax, it would fail, right? These are strict systems. Whereas uh, in LLM, uh, there's a statistical relationship with misspelled words to the correctly spelled ones. And so that's why things like chat kind of work themselves out and uh, can compensate on a slightly off input. And they're, they're pretty helpful for user-based systems for that reason too. Um, they often know multiple languages. Quen is a um, large language model that, that's a free download, Apache licensed from Alibaba. And that one knows dozens of written languages. So if you wanted it to respond back and forth about a topic that it, was, that it had seen in English, it's perfectly happy to do that. This happens to be Malay. I, I used to live in Malaysia. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the funny, uh, tricky spots of LLMs that people talk about often is hallucination. Uh, and this is where you get some nonsense responses or just something that's assertively said factually incorrect. <laughs> and that's because they, uh, LLM does not necessarily know the difference between correct uh, or not. It just has a statistical relationship. Um, and where something's missing, it may just fill the gaps. Like if you put somebody on the spot, you know, there's different ways someone could respond to that. They can make something up or they could, you know, shirk. They don't, they don't often say, no, I don't know, but they, you know. Anyway, there's some mitigation approaches to this. Um, different models uh, have uh, more uh, data in different areas that they were trained with. And also the amount of parameters that the, that the model is, uh, has, uh, which has a direct relationship to usage, but uh, that can help with it. There are many approaches. But uh, basically, if you were to talk about Bouvet Island and ask what the capital is, well, there's no capital. It's just penguins there. Uh, I use this example because I used to work at Netflix, and we were working on DNS technology. We we're thinking, what's an ISO code that's actually defined that has no permanent population? <laughs> and uh, so we would, you know, in our test, black hole this island. But um, don't worry, it was never product count, but it was just fun. Um, the other thing weird about LLMs is that, that there's no relationship between like a new LLM and the data that it's been trained on unless they say it in the docs. Um, and so you could say like, okay, well, uh, Meta, Facebook, have a, a LLM that they, they call Llama. And like Llama 3.2 comes out or whatever, and you're like, wow, it's out. So finally, it, it knows like about the last World Series. No, <laughs> it, it just means that this is a new, has new features, it may be super smart, but it has nothing to do with the, the, um, the data unless it says so. And there's this concept called knowledge cutoff. And, um, and then there's a strange twist to this, which is that the LLM itself may hallucinate if you ask it about its knowledge cutoff and just give you a nonsense answer. <laughs> so uh, you basically, unfortunately, need to read the docs if you care about that. <clears throat> now, um, what we usually use for an approach uh, to put new knowledge or private knowledge into, a, into a, a large language model is to retrieve it from somewhere and then augment it by putting this in, in the context of our question. like. What's the latest of Go? And then attachment of like the release notes. <laughs> um, that type of approach is typically called ROG, but there's many, many different nuances of how to put things into context so that the LLM might know more information or private information um, that, ha that it hadn't seen in its uh, training. 
So, uh, you know, with that word assistant, Jenny and I is frequently used for assistance and assisting us. Um, and that's the thing that, that leverages the strengths because, you know, when you're dealing with assisting humans, they misspell things, they talk in different languages and stuff like that. Um, they may have different knowledge that they are supposed to be uh, uh, having as, as an implicit. Um, and also, I didn't talk about it yet, but LLMs can be quite uh, slow as compared to like a database query. Uh, so you could, could be spending 30 seconds to get an answer. And, uh, but if the human decides that there's enough value there, they're going to be okay with that. <laughs> just, just make sure that they see the ticking thing. Um, so finally, we covered the first two topics. Let's try to connect them. So observability and Gen AI. Um, so like I said in the beginning, we can do it both ways. Uh, if we're talking about uh, AI observability, then we're talking about monitoring, sorry. Uh, and if we're talking about observability with AI, we're talking about like making our, our stuff better by using um, technology that is, that's employing LLMs, for example, inside of the um, network architecture of it. So let's start with uh, observability of the AI stuff. Um, one thing that's very scary is people say like, okay, well, I've got Gen AI and, and like now I need to like hire a million people because nobody knows about this stuff. And if you think of it like this, like open AI is, is fundamentally a REST API. We have used REST APIs before. <laughs> um, so it's just a stack of technology. Of course, it's an interesting, like weird thing in the middle of it, but it's still an HTTP service and we can treat it like an HTTP service as an observability system. Maybe the fields we use are, are different, but uh, what you'll notice is instead of blaming the database, you can blame the LLM. So that's basically what we need to get to, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that big, that big line there is a, is a call to an LLM to ans answer a question from a Flask route at the top. There's no reason why you should think of an app that has Gen AI in it any different then you do your other stuff. But then I kind of lied a little bit. <laughs> there are some things that are important about Gen AI with observability. And part of it is because of the way that the community works. Um, if you think of it, like, Gen AI is sort of like more close to um, data science and machine learning than it is to like system and platform engineering. And there's also um, a reality of of like accuracy and interest in evaluating different types of responses there. So sometimes the users themselves and the developers will have different needs than a traditional observability platform will have been set up for. Um, so Langtrace is, a, uh, is an open source product and, and one of the founders there I, I collaborate with in the OpenTelemetry uh, SIG and, and I asked whether there are three pillars of, of observability for Gen AI. And the tracing is, is certainly in interesting. And I'll just call out the thing that's, that's different. Um, basically, success rate uh, is subjective, right? Uh, did, the, did the request complete successfully, like HTTP 200? Was it actually the answer that was helpful or not? Are <laughs> two different answers, right? Um, also, cost, um, because uh, I, wish I, I, I wish I saved the tweet in a way besides clicking on it. but. Um, basically, I saw something where someone had a, a Gen AI project, and they decided not to run CI for a pretty good reason, because every, every CI run would cost them 20 bucks. <laughs> and uh, so there could be some significant costs. Um, this idea of evaluations, where you have a system where, for example, this assistant is coming back with, with responses, sometimes to the same question, and you want to figure out what is the accurate like what was the precise answer. And um, so that can be evaluated in terms of automation, like maybe another LLM is, is supposed to inspect the question and the answer and, and make a score about whether it was you know, likely to be useful or not. And it could also be a user feedback loop. And if it's in a feedback loop, then what could happen is that that data could be fed back into a, um, a data set, which then could be used to kind of improve the next um, type of questions. And that's a very rich experience if you think about it from an from um, observability standpoint versus a, a typical um, like chart. Um, some more stuff, just because you know I've got it on here, might as well say. <laughs> uh, some challenges that I've, I've noticed is that uh, OpenAI is like the behemoth. 
like it's like Amazon used to be uh, for for cloud. Sorry, Amazon, and that that means that like everybody anchors things towards what o OpenAI does, even though it's actually a quite diverse ecosystem. There's many, 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 many model providers and frameworks and things like that, and so it's easy to anchor on what OpenAI does, uh, uh, and that could be over anchoring. Um, the other thing is that because not all of the features are actually in a public issues list, um, you don't necessarily know what's going to be released until someone already releases it. And because it's a very fast moving environment, that can lead to uh, users demanding something that's only days or hours old. And so that's kind of for, for platform engineering, that's a challenge um, to kind of um, keep up with these feature demands that are, that are happening that, that fast. The other thing interesting for observability is that the, uh, because of this evaluation system, it implies you're collecting res request and response data, which has, of course, the normal things you would expect. You have uh, PII concerns, you have volume concerns. And, and again, from the Netflix example, back in the day, if I asked somebody to, to make the request response system, it would cost more than playing the movies. <laughs> so you have to be careful with things. Of course, that doesn't mean every request is gonna result in an LM request, or that the rate of those that makes this a big problem, but it's, it's something that's anchoring. Uh, while I didn't talk about this idea of token, if you think about like any machine, like you've got quarters to play the game, you could use tokens to play the game. Um, token is like a, a metering unit in, in uh, LLMs, both the input and the output, and it's typically how things are built as well. And because these are spend metrics, and it doesn't matter if it's text or video or audio, token is, is, the, is the way. Um, people are often wanting to see that while they're acting. And you can see this if you actually were to go to ChatGPT, it will tell you the tokens that are, that are being used. And so with a typical um, telemetry setup, you have an asynchronous relationship with statistics. It's shipping the data out, you know, and then you've got some stuff going on. Um, in this case, it's not like the first time this has ever happened, but there's an um, anchoring towards like seeing, seeing what, what I'm spending kind of in terms of tokens. Um, and so that makes it a very interesting spend system and biz metric all at the same time. Um, the other thing is that just that like, uh, I, I remember when I first started in the SIG, people were talking about like how many months one vendor was older than the other vendor. <laughs> so like it's a fairly new space and there aren't really a lot of common tools with regards to observability uh, and that's a, that's a work in progress, um, but uh, so it's not as mature there. Uh, on the other hand, to compensate for that, if you think of it just as a web request system, then uh, you have plenty of tools that you can use. They don't have to be specialized necessarily. And the last point is this thing that like accuracy, I kind of touched on that. It's subjective um, wh whether the risk request was, was correct or not. And also the same type of response could be correct in one scenario, but not another. So that's why you're gonna see a lot of evaluation type stuff coming up. So let's go the other way. Um, now we've got any system, doesn't have to be LLM uh, ba uh, based thing that we're looking at. It could be just normal web requests, database, which is always the slow part, right? Um, how do we make that better? How do we blame things better with Gen AI, right? So um, we can use Gen AI in, in many different ways. And when I say we can, there are, you know, these are already done. So I say like, where are we going? Where are we going is not universally, you know, converged and never is. Um, but um, f versus assistant, uh, you can assist with tools, right? So uh, any tool that, that needs setup, uh, the AI could possibly help even perform those setup tasks for you. Um, anything like, uh, uh, pattern extracting and such. Uh, you can use typical AI. You can also use uh, generative AI with um, things like configuring uh, data feeds. So if you have, uh, I'll go into some examples of this. And then the, one of the things that would be probably more unique than the other ones is um, linking human created stuff with your system created stuff. So if you have inconsistently labeled things, if you have, uh, uh, help desk tickets written by humans that have like a not a very strong relationship to to particular like system entities. Um, those relationships could be built with Gen AI, even if they're in different languages. Um, and going back to logs, um, if we think of it this way, you know AI could be a way to get more out of them. Um, 
you know, we do know that log start before everything, including things like tracing. So there, there are maybe maybe some untapped parts of observability that that could be looked at in a different way. And uh, I went to Kubicon, China, and one of the things I, I forgot the tech that I was uh, listening to, but they were saying like, you know, we want to use Gen AI because like all these plugins are changing their log formats. <laughs> like, there's so many plugins, so many different things, and they're not required to coordinate in any way. And of course, the plugin could have a major version, and you wouldn't know. Like, you just see that the log format changed. So it, these are cases where um, it could be cloud native problem, <laughs> but um, it's not exclusively, right? But um, and then of course, if you do have the ability to, to bring more knowledge into the into context, like source code, you can cross check that. Uh, I have a friend of mine who I won't mention because I don't want to get them in trouble, but they work at SharePoint. They said that like the entire SharePoint source code is in context <laughs> in the SharePoint team. I don't know if that's completely factual, but I'm going to take it because it sounds cool. Um, let's look at some examples. So one thing uh, I just happened upon recently is this thing called CaseGPT. And um, it's a fairly new project, um, but what it does is you have different types of things that can um, process events like, for example, if you are familiar with Trivi or any of the other um, type of vulnerability and misconfiguration tools, it will say like, okay, this and this CVE or something like that or, or whatever. But like, what's the first thing you do? You kind of like take that and you, you, you duck, duck, go or Brave or whatever your favorite search engine is and you try to figure out what the heck that is. So contextualizing these type codes and and anything else um, would be helpful if you already know Kate's. But if you don't know Kate's, what if you don't even know Docker? And you get a uh, question like, back off pulling image. <laughs> so like for me, I think the first time I saw back off pulling, I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so this can rephrase that and saying like, well, there may be, maybe an image that doesn't exist or you don't have connectivity to it. Maybe you should check Docker because this is like probably Docker. Um, so, like, what kind of image is it? Was that an MPEG? Like, no, this is probably a Docker image because in the context of Kate's, that's what it is, right? So I'm not saying that, like, every day you're going to have a problem like this, but it's, I thought it was a pretty interesting um, project. Um, I work at Elastic. We have Kibana, which is basically a, a, you know, monitoring management portal thing. And uh, there's actually several uh, AI assistants in there. And actually, the cool thing is, is that it's, uh, this, the source is there. So you can go to Elastic Kibana. You can see actually how these things work. Um, but uh, there's an AI assistant, and it can do things like integrate with uh, uh, your ticketing system and, and everything else, and try to explain what's on the screen uh, in terms that, that would be easier to understand if you, didn't, if you weren't like an expert yet, and can also do things like uh, create run books for you and, and make reports. Um, one of the assistants is this thing called automatic import, which again, you can just take a look at the source if you're that kind of person. Um, but what this does is it um, basically, you can say like, here's an S3 bucket full of logs. <laughs> and this is representative of the data that I'm importing. And it can try to um, extract fields from that to kind of set up a data uh, data integration for you. So um, when we think of assistance, oftentimes we're talking, we're thinking about chat assistance, but there are many types of assistance, and configuration assistance is another type of thing. Um, and then I want to say, like, observability with AI isn't always Gen AI. Um, forgive me for not remembering the company out there, but one of the sponsors uh, says, like, you know, observability with AI. And um, there's no reason why everything has to be uh, Gen AI. So we've been using AI for years. Uh, things like um, uh, prediction and uh, trying to take something that is high cardinality, like a HTTP request with a UID in it, and try to reduce the cardinality by recognizing patterns. Machine learning models have been doing these for years. It's a form of AI. Um, not everything is AI. But let's, let's talk about like one specific case. Now, I'm, I'm cl clicking a blog here, not just because of my company, but you can blame that. Uh, but also, I think it's interesting, um, which is that um, we have other models, right, that you can run. Um, BERT is a bi-directional model, so it's not unidirectional causal model like, a, like an LLM. 
and uh, it can do a thing called uh, named entity recognition. And so in this case, it can try to figure out, like say if you were to use this type of model, it could like, if in text, it could figure out something as a, a country or a city or a person, uh, things like that, classifications. And um, you, can, you can use this in a pipeline uh, to, to like do things like redaction. And so primarily in this case, it's not really Gen AI in this AI system. But there are some places where you could use Gen AI to um, play with it even more. For example, uh, if you're thinking about uh, PII, PII, and what if your, your job is like a messenger app, like you have people who are writing messages and like you're not sure whether something is PII because they're using a bunch of slang, and that's not necessarily something that this pipeline will be great at identifying but uh, an LLM might be better at, at identifying. Or you want to check and see if something is technically sensitive, but not, sens not sensitive in context or vice versa. So you can kind of like you, a person, <laughs> not you necessarily, uh, but uh, someone can, can make a system like that, mixing and matching. So anyway, let's close up. Um, and uh, so, Basically, in my opinion, uh, Gen AI is more about humans than other sorts of AI in many ways uh, because there's nuance of, of language that's captured. Um, they don't require hiring an ML team to run <laughs> or, or use, uh, so they're actually a little bit more human friendly. Um, and uh, you, you're going to find more of these things um, doing uh, laborious tasks or, or tedious ones, such as like root cause analysis. Um, and flex with things that are also uh, quite tedious or even um, vexing to deal with, like uh, changing log formats and, and such. Um, <clears throat> if you think about like when we're collecting metrics, nowadays sometimes you may have uh, like 100 attributes that are defined on something and you can't necessarily like keep in your mind what all these things are for, whereas there's not really a, a limitation there with an AI system. Um, so, um, and then of course, non-traditional facts, which makes it a little bit more creative and interesting as a, as a uh, platform architect. When you can bring in things that are non-traditional sources, you have more, more ways uh, to, to solve a problem than you did. Um, and I, I've put some, some links here. Again, uh, these aren't link links because I, I didn't want to like uh, shower this with QR codes, but anyway, you can, you can just these terms will get you where you need to, to go. And, and if you have a problem with that, take a screenshot and then put it in the LLM. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks for, thanks for your time. And I, I think I'm out of time, maybe? Yep. So, um, but anyway, it's a coffee break. If you want to grab me later, uh, that, that's cool, too. Thanks for uh, uh, all of your uh, uh, attention.